welcome to our first worship in December. I have, as you know, just come back after a little break and I've been doing some reading and one of the books that I found, which I, I'm sure is going to influence some of what I say um, during this month of December, is um, The Wisdom of Call the Midwife. I thought it's very appropriate um, when we're talking about birth. And, and there's some wonderful wisdom in this book and I'm going to start this morning's worship just with a little quote by um, the narrator um, who is representing Jennifer Worth, the author of the book The Call of the Midwife and this is what she says Thinking about looking forward to a new day dawning when Jesus comes again we speak of the dawn of a new day, as though it's a whole welcome thing. But there are times when dawn breaks into darkness, forcing us to face the things we knew we never knew we'd see. We recount old beats of other stories. We retrace our steps, take refuge in echoes of that which is familiar. We follow custom and ritual because we have no map. We reach out blindly, for we cannot see the path. And far from home, we cling to the way these things are always done. All of that is our human condition. And each advent, we're challenged. Each advent, we're called to dream. We're called to think of that dawn of a new day when all will be well. And this year, most poignantly, we are looking to that new day when we come out of Covid. Never mind Jesus coming again. I hope that during this season of Advent you do find some time to be, some time to Work on your relationship with God and some time to reorientate your life on the path that we know that God wants for each one of us. So welcome to our worship today. Welcome to old friends and new. And I hope that you will find during this time that we can all share together albeit remotely, that you will hear God's voice speaking to you in the wilderness, the desert, wherever you find yourself. Just let God lead you and guide you. Our opening prayer. Even if we cannot gather in person, Emmanuel, God with us. Even if some Christmas traditions have had to go, Emmanuel, God with us. Even if we might not get to hug family and friends, Emmanuel, God with us. Even if we cannot sing carols beside each other, Emmanuel, God with us. Even if Christmas cheer is harder this year, Emmanuel, God with us. God of faithfulness and trust. You sent your servant, John the Baptist, to preach in the desert and summon people to repentance. Make us and all things new, that in the wilderness of our hearts we too may prepare a way over which your Son may walk. The candle we light today 
represents the messengers like the angel and John the Baptist in the Christmas story. The word angel is derived from the Hebrew and Greek words which mean messenger, deliver a message. We hear the reading of the day the angel came to Mary. The birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favoured one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can that be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this in the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible for God. Then Mary said, Here am I the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Thanks be to God. We give thanks for all God's messengers today and we think of our response to being asked, as Mary was, to serve the Lord. We sing, Here I am to worship. Thank you. 
the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptised by him in the river Jordan. John wore clothing made of camel's hair, with a leather belt round his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. And so let's have a little think about what the message is for us today. I chose the theme this week, Messengers, and who are God's messengers today? You would be forgiven for imagining or believing that actually the messengers of today are the ones who are confident in their cause, well equipped, rich, powerful and yeah you could believe that however we know the story of faith is a bit different to that and the conventions that we maybe would take in the secular world are quite different in the realms of the teachings of Jesus because messengers are usually people who are unusual or maybe lower status and crucially those who speak from their heart and if we think about the Christmas story that's coming we think of the angels but we think of the shepherds who were messengers we think of John the Baptist and that's where we're going this morning We read, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. The word of God didn't come to any of those, um, it didn't come to any of those religious bigwigs in Rome or Judea or Jerusalem. Instead, they came to John, a nobody, out in the middle of nowhere. One who was possibly considered a freak, as we elsewhere have read that he fed on locusts and wild honey and wore clothing of camel's hair. And the word of God came in that place, that desolate place, that inhospitable, uninhabitable desert. God's message of life and salvation seems to come to someone unlikely to be heard and to a place where in fact it would seem that the message would never stand a chance of ever taking root. Now this might all be surprising to us if we didn't know that God tends to work in this way. Not using those we'd expect, the rich, the powerful and the influential. Um, those with um, the best resumes to do God's work and bring God's message. But instead, it would be those that we least expect. The meek, the lowly, even the despised, the rejected, the powerless. Those who would be more likely that we overlook or ignore. That it seems that God's preferred modus operandi is 
to go to the last place that we think to look, to do the thing we'd least expect with the persons who we'd never guess. Now, those in power would like us to believe that we should look to them for all we need to know to get by in the world. But God tells us differently. And he actually, I think, saying, if you do that, you're going to miss my point. Why? Well, God is challenging the very ways of those who have money, power and influence in the world. And, of course, that includes you and me. Too often we get stuck in the ways of the world. The ways of comfort, the ways of status quo. And we lose sight and drift away from God. And that's God's message for us this Advent, isn't it? Advent is a time of preparing, of getting back to the point. When we're stuck in the ways of the status quo changing us, because it's difficult and it tends to be a nice place, then there we know what to expect and there's no surprises but God is actually about to surprise us even threaten our comfortable existences and we're not to get into the habit of the status quo working well for us because sometimes when we resist change that's not what God wants Sometimes too, when we know the current systems aren't working anymore and we see what needs to be changed, we need a messenger to come and remind us, point the way, prompt us, get our attention, waken us up, shake us out of complacency and actually call us to repent. That's Advent, a time to reorientate ourselves to what God has in mind for us. And today we've heard of a very person who fitted that job, a very full job description. I wonder if it fits you. Locust munching. I'm sorry, I am not into um, the... Um, jungle thing um, and eating locusts. Camel hair weaving, oh, sorry, camel hair wearing. Now that sounds a bit itchy to me, that doesn't sound comfortable. Wilderness crier? I I'm not drawn to the wilderness, I don't know about you. But John the Baptist fitted all those criteria and he broke quite a few of the social etiquette of the day. I think messengers today might not quite seem so unconventional. And if that's not true, they still need to surprise us in some ways by maybe upturning the social conventions. When I think of modern day messengers, or prophets. I think about those who stand up for the rights to be heard of those who are the weakest. I think of those who keep showing up, speaking out, speaking for and even having their integrity attacked because of those who stand in opposition to their position. When I think of messengers for today, I think of those who speak out for justice. Those who stand up and remind us of that biblical mandate to love our neighbours. By doing so, we're welcoming Jesus. I wonder who might the prophets, sorry, who might be the prophets who are calling us in the institutional church to imagine differently what it means to be church today. 
I think we need to look around ourselves, around our church congregations, around our church circles and to see who those prophets are that are standing out. Are they the ones who are challenging us to rethink, to use our buildings in different ways, to be outposts for mission? Or maybe we don't even need buildings anymore. We spend so much time, don't we, and energy, worrying about shrinking numbers, worrying about finances and influence. And yet some of the people who are um, concentrating on those things might actually be, be, be the messengers that are helping us to see what the Church of Jesus can be for this, this age, this day, this time, in this century. Of course, messengers or prophets like John the Baptist and other examples that God sends bring us the messages that are not very popular and they challenge us to step out of comfort zones. John was in the wilderness. Maybe we are being challenged to step out into the wilderness where we feel the discomfort of seeing and hearing things differently. Stepping into the wilderness where we can dream, dare to dream, of a different future than the one we're in now. Church past, church present, church future. We are being invited this Advent to step into that wilderness, to reorientate ourselves and to prepare ourselves for Jesus' coming again, to prepare the way of the Lord. I don't think there can be a more significant time in my lifetime that we're not called to think of this. When we're called into that wilderness, when we're challenged to what we think or believe or how we act, that is often the place where we are changed, transformed. As when all else is removed from our attention, we can wrestle with all those emotions of grief, of anger, of worry, of fear and of loss and come out the other side being reorientated. I think all those points are so valid for our churches today. We and the church being driven to the wilderness, being challenged spiritually, economically, politically and socially by that call to repent, to turn ourselves, to receive and join in God's vision. God's messengers shake us and wake us to God's dream for us and the world. Driven by them to the wilderness, we discover there, on the paths, the valleys, the mountains, the hills, that rough way that the Lord has prepared. As we make that journey, God prepares us. And then nothing will be the same ever again. Nothing and it's never too late. So my challenge today is, are you listening for the messengers? Are you expecting a messenger? And are you ready to welcome the messengers? Amen. Oh, 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 oh,
So hello everybody, thank you for coming to share with me my little um, idea about you being bringers of hope. Um, it's a good thing to be, isn't it, a bringer of hope? Mm. Yeah. So um, I know there are many people within our church families who can actually perhaps be given that title. In fact, we all should be given that title, but... I just thought it would be good to just share some of the ways in which we do bring hope to our communities. Um, and and so I've invited Dean and um, Peter and Sheila and Mo and John and Janet to actually help us um, just reflect a little bit on how we can bring hope to the world. So I'm going to start with Dean. And Dean, would you like to just tell us a little bit about what you do? Yes, uh, there are, would you believe, about 160 families in Rochdale uh, where one or both of the parents uh, have some form of illness, which means that their children have to look after them, hence the title Young Carers. One of the most uh, worthwhile projects we're involved in, we're friends of families who organise it, is the Christmas Hamper Project, which began over 20 years ago. And the idea is we write out to mostly churches, just one Rotary Club, and say, would you be prepared to adopt a family and provide a, a Christmas hamper? And we usually get a very good response. We give details of the family and the details of sort of food and other things that the family would appreciate in their hamper and uh, off, off they go. And then this near the beginning of December, all these hampers arrive at the office and it's a wonderful sight. You have never seen such an array of food and presents and hampers. Uh, it's amazing. But the more important thing, the staff who take the hampers out to the families say that they are astounded, they are amazed, they are deeply touched that they are people who don't know them at all, but are so very generous to them. And uh, instead of their looking forward to Christmas, not you know, what, what's going to happen, no money, can't buy my kids presents, so on and so forth, Christmas is transformed. 
And uh, interestingly, this project received national um, approval, recognition, because we got a, a, a special award from the um, uh, Family Action saying this was a wonderful piece of voluntary work. That's it. Wow, Dean, thank you. That is a really good cause. Is it, it's, um, just ask you one question. Is it, if anybody wanted to donate, is it too late this year? Uh, no, we are, we are uh, being on the uh, Thrum Hall at the lower door on Saturday morning between 10 and uh, 12, and you can bring money or presents suitable for either mum, dad, or teenage children. Can I just interrupt there and say, Dean, when this, this goes out, it will be after Saturday. So um, you'll have to try and contact um, yes. myself or, or one of the stewards of the church. But if anybody wants to, please just yes, send yes. us a message. Yes, Post yes, it yes. On, on the YouTube clip at the bottom and we'll, we'll get back to you. Right, okay, absolutely. thank you. Peter. Um, me. Yeah. Yes. Um, I helped to run a recently formed charity called Drumbeat UK. Uh, Drumbeat works um, in Uganda. Uganda's in Central East Africa uh, and its southern border is on Lake Victoria and the equator goes slap through the middle of it. So it's a very hot. It's a very, very poor country and it has been devastated by lots of things in its past. One of the most important was Idi Amin, and the second one was the AIDS epidemic, which has decimated the whole country, so that there are most of the children who have lost one or both parents. And most of the children are being looked after by elderly, elderly grandparents, siblings, aunts and uncles, even neighbours. And to add to all that, the two most important things for a good life, education and health, are not free. Now, most people in Uganda live on a subsistence level. Um, and it's not for most of the children. It's no guarantee that they eat each day. So we are working um, with our sister charity, Drumbeat Uganda. And our aim is to get children into school. And we do that by um, fundraising here and inviting people to take on long-term sponsorship of a child's education. And it costs about £20 a month. And so it, it gets children into school because education is the way out of the trap of poverty. And by going to school and becoming educated, they then grow up and are able to care for themselves and care for their own children and send their own children to school. At the minute, we have 88 children in school who are sponsored by 64 different sponsors. So this Christmas, we are sending out a lot of money to pay for their fees to start them off in this new school year in February. So that's what Drumbeat does. Thank you. Thank you. And just a little plug, Peter, there are Christmas cards on sale still, aren't there? For yes. Oh, yes. Got plenty left. Contact us if you'd like some of those as well. Okay. Um, I'm going to introduce you now to Sheila. Sheila is the chair of Psych Base, which um, Psych Methodist Church are in partnership with. And um, Sheila's got many, many... Um, shall we say, she's got a lot of influence in, in, in the community, haven't you, from on all levels, but you can explain a little bit more. Well, I feel like I've been thrown in at the deep end here because I wasn't aware that I was going to have to speak uh, <laughs> and I didn't know quite what about. Uh, but SAC Community Base is something that we started uh, in 2000 and it's gone from strength to strength. It started, first of all, in my house, when it got too much for the person that was based there and who I was working with, we started in a unit in Fieldhouse Industrial Estate. We started with one unit. We finished up with the whole floor of uh, Fieldhouse Mill. Uh, and we got our money through a, a government scheme to start off with. 
that government scheme was coming to an end and we were about to lose our money when we were on the Secret Millionaire programme on Channel 4. And Hilary DeVere, some of you may know her from Dragon's Den, actually gave us £62,000 to enable us to continue. But £62,000 didn't go very far when our rent was £23,000 a year. So we were coming to the end of our life when uh, Psych Chapel offered us a home. It was on a much smaller scale than we'd been used to in the past, but we pared ourselves down and we moved in and we were very happy to do so. Since we've moved in there, we have not just become a user of the uh, church, but we have become part of the church. And together we have been able to uh, go, which probably John will be talking about, go from strength to strength. Uh, the community centre side of the church brings in over 300 people in a week with lots and lots of different activities. Whilst the church is being refurbished, most of these activities are actually being run online. And we're trying our level best to keep people interested for when we're ready to open again in the new year. Uh, we have a meeting next week of the trustees of Site Community Base when I'm hoping that they'll share with me in my suggestion of putting Christmas, small Christmas gifts together for our over 50s and perhaps something for our young people because we need to make sure that they realise that we're still there for them, we still want to see them when we're ready to open again and we still want to, them to know that we are thinking about them, not only at Christmas but throughout the year. Thanks Sheila, that's great. Um, I, I, I know as Minister of Psych how much we're involved with the community and and the opportunities that are there that are amazing, really. So. I put a great big piece on Facebook last night for those people that are interested. Right. I know, Helen, you've seen it. And I thought, just to remind people what we were doing at this time last year and how important the Christmas tree was to us, not only for the light switch on, but also for the service and carols around the tree, which I know we've all enjoyed along with church members. And we're going to miss that this year. Yeah, absolutely. OK, I'm going to go to John now, um, because John has been um, working on behalf of the church within this project. And, and John, would you like to just share how what you've done to bring hope? Because you've actually brought a lot to the church. <laughs> um, well, um, I hope so. Um, I guess go on because I'm I'm a Whittle and, and the Whittle Mafia have a long history at Psych. Uh, and I guess it was I suppose when my dad left some money, I contacted this sort of energy I didn't know her, this energetic, committed, enthusiastic minister by the name of Helen Johnson. And she said the church is gonna close. You know, it's kind of got a hole in the roof, uh, the congregation's down to ten, but I want to save it and I want to make a community church. And that sparked my interest, uh, more than my interest. Um, and from there on, I was a bit hooked, really. So I think for the last five years, I've been involved either as a volunteer or currently as a, a paid circuit community worker, which is all of, don't forget, nine hours a week, which suits me fine. Well, I suppose I, I kind of brought my skills from my past job uh, which was really about bringing hope to individuals and communities and to bear on, on a new thing that I had close to my heart. Um, and Sheila won't mind me saying this, but in the early days, I guess, I spent a bit of time doing a little bit of mediation between the, the community groups and the church. And that's a skill I've not needed for the last two, 12 months because that partnership has really blossomed and, and has grown. Uh, now, Sheila's described the the reason why we're doing this, and that's about the people of Psyche, uh, who are in one of the lowest deprived groups in the country, who there are lots of needs and lots of individuals who who need something. Uh, and and what the, the base and the church do together is provide those things for up to those 300 people a week. Uh, a lot of my work has been involved in fundraising, uh, and that means sort of writing applications with a lot of help from other people, 
and we have changed the building. We got the roof, we got the render, we got the new kitchen, we put some heating in. Uh, the builders are in right now, ripping, ripping psych part uh, to build a new floor that will extend our our sort of range and double the numbers of people who we can who we can work with. Uh, and we know that there's a need because people tell us that. We, we we were operating nine till nine, five days a week, and couldn't fit any more groups in. Um, and I guess in one sense we'd beat COVID because whilst we've been closed, the building is being sort of built upon and, and ripped apart and rebuilt. And I think that when when we do open, we will have that building fit for purpose. Uh, and I think that is going to bring a new phase for church and and hope as well to around, what, 500 people a week who are going to be coming through our doors. So hope is all around. It is. Okay, so I'm going to come to Mo now. Now, I know what Mo's going to say. She's going to say, I don't know why you've got me on here. But actually, Mo, what you've been doing has just <laughs> meant so much to, I think, just, then you know the members of the individual churches and members of the community because you've been doing something rather special haven't you oh, i guess i guess so i'm uh, making an assumption to start with that everybody's heard of rochdale soup kitchen because that's a story in itself and we get lots of donations from lots of stores and one of those is Marks and Spencer's. And you may well remember that their new store opened about three weeks after lockdown in March, and it's considerably bigger than the other one. So we get food, but we also get a plethora of flowers, which they, in their wisdom, great for us, but they're past the sell-by date, they're not, they last for ages. So because they're flowers, um, we had to shift them fairly quickly. And at first, um, they were given out to the pastoral list at Thrum Hall just because it was the first thing I thought of. Didn't actually think how long it would take to do that, but that also is another story. But then after that, um, we looked into how many hostels there were in the town. And there are 14 as far as there could be more, but I know of 14. So the staff and the clients, when appropriate, also got flowers after you can appreciate this would take a long time they've got to be shifted quick when we get them but some weeks we didn't get any some weeks we got 80 bunches and um, so it was just sort of a little bit strung out and as someone said earlier and I've not thought of this I can't just remember who it was they were the hostels in particular the staff were absolutely thrilled to bits that we thought of them but even more so um Someone suggested we give to schools. That was not possible. Too many schools, too many staff. So we just gave to the schools who teach children with special needs only, not the ones who teach them in an ordinary school. And their reaction was, um, well, it was lovely, but I hadn't realised how perhaps, not downtrodden that, but sort of, I think they felt bottom of the pile sometimes. In fact, one of them said that. So that was really good, and, and it's great to do that for them. Um, so now that's they've all had, they've all had, and we will start again as and when. So now we're doing people who are sick. Anybody can ring and say, I know someone, it doesn't have to be somebody at church, it can be a neighbour, it can be a relative, anyone really who would appreciate a bunch of flowers. So there's always people who are poorly, aren't there? And sadly... This year, always people who've lost people, perhaps more than ever. And even those who live alone. And I've I've gone relatively recently around to the, the single people within our churches, whatever age they are. Um, and any spares. And today, I think I've brought home about 16 bunches. So today's a good day. Um, I'll be taking them up to the food share up at Whitworth and obviously the people who pop in will get them because that's the last thing they'd be thinking of buying is a bunch of flowers and I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunity this is just going to keep repeating itself there are always people who appreciate flowers whether there's anything wrong with you or not um, 
and and that's it really that that's all it is delivering flowers to people who appreciate it but it's just giving them that moment of the fact that they are special for that moment mm. I think that's yeah yeah I think uh, I think oh, that's come really. across yeah yeah it has yeah so thank you and thank you to Marks and Spencers of course yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> They do know. I have told them where they go and they're always pleased to hear, you know, they're, they're a nice bunch, the guys who help out with the filling the car up at the end of the day. Yeah. Brilliant. So um, last but not least, I'm going to Janet now. Janet works at um, the Bridge Centre at Smithy Bridge. She's also a member of Smithy Bridge um, Fellowship there and um, she works tirelessly and she's just going to give you a snapshot of what she's doing that brings hope to the people who drop in and the people who deliberately go to the Bridge Centre because they know it's a place of welcome. Yeah, I mean, it's been a, a very strange year for all of us and it certainly has for us because we traditionally have had a charity shop and a cafe which people have dropped into and the cafe has been the main place where people have come to talk. But over lockdown, we realised that suddenly we were we were the church in the community and we were the only place that was open on behalf of the church and so we just wanted to reach out and bless people around us so during lockdown we were taking cakes leaving them on doorsteps randomly we went and we took cakes into the staff at the two care homes in the village and into the school um, we also blessed all the members of staff in the two care homes in the village with a little angel with a special knitted, uh, special message on for the lockdown time. So that's what we did then. Um, now, as we come in towards Christmas, we are planning to just send hundreds of angels out into the community again with messages of hope for people. I mean, I, I hoped that we'd have enough to do every house in the village, but I think we've just about hit 700 angels, which will go out. So that's exactly half of the houses in the village. So that's pretty amazing that we'll be able to bless each one with a special message this year. Um, we're also going to take a gift into the school, all the teachers and staff within the schools and into the care homes, um, again to say thank you you're appreciated um and it will be a, a box of heroes to say you are heroes in our community um and a little card from the church and the bridge center so that's the other thing we're, we're planning to do this christmas and then every christmas we also have had carols round the tree at the bridge center and realized that it's not going to happen this year so we've decided that we're going to take the carols to the people. So we're going to carol sing around the village and we're going to distribute the angels at the same time. So we're going to get out and bless the village this year and just say, you know, there is hope in this really dark time um, and we are still here for you. Thanks, Janet. That's amazing. So in each one of um, the people that have shared have had a really amazing story to tell. Um, and um, I know there are more. And I'm hoping that we're going to get more stories coming in over the next few weeks as we go up to Christmas, so that after Christmas we can look forward in 2021 with hope. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for just... Um, offering your hearts uh, in the things that you do. That's wonderful. God bless. Thank you. And now our prayers of thanksgiving. There is a response, which is thanks be to God. Let us give thanks to the Lord for all his goodness, for the opportunity to meet in worship, in person or online. Thanks be to God for what has been good for us and others during this past week. Thanks be to God for those who provide for our needs 
and especially for the sick and disadvantaged. Thanks be to God. For those who give leadership in church, in state, in community and every walk of life. Thanks be to God. For friends and family, for companions in the way of Christ. Thanks be to God. For all that makes life beautiful and interesting and worthwhile. Thanks be to God. For the ministry of John the Baptist and all who direct others to Jesus. Thanks be to God. For those who have gone before us and enjoy the life of heaven. Thanks be to God. We say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
In the book of Isaiah, we hear that God holds each one of us close, just as the shepherds care for their flocks, tending, guarding, governing and providing pasture for them. And in the same way, the Good Shepherd shows this same tender care for us, God's people. For people caring faithfully for the well-being of others and showing love in practical ways, we ask for God's help and strength. And today we remember. We remember all those who are unable to access the medication that they need particularly at this time when COVID is affecting us. Strengthen us that we may never grow weary of doing good in your name. Strengthen us to offer hope to others, to be those bringers of hope. Help us to raise our voices in solidarity with those who have been silenced and help us always to seek justice for those whose lives are much harder than our own. We thank Jesus for being the Good Shepherd, the one who cares equally for us all and helps us to follow his example. We say goodbye for this week as we now listen to a prayer written by Paul Field reminding us that whoever we are, we can come to Jesus for healing, for peace. God of the moon and stars, God of the near and far, God of these fragile hearts, we all are come to you. God of our history, God of the future that what will you make of me? I come to you, God of the meek and mild, God of the reckless and the wild, God of the unreconciled. I come. God of our life and death God of our secrets unconfessed God of our every living breath I come to you God of the rich and poor God of the princess and the whore God of the ever open door, I come to you. God of the unborn child, God of the pure and undefiled, God of the pimp and pedophile, I come to you. God of the war and peace God of the junkie and the priest God of the greatest and the least I come to you God of the refugee God of the prisoner and 
free God of my doubts and certainty I come to you Come to us, we come to you.